Welcome to today's webinar with SCA. Uh, today's webinar, we welcome Oscar lopez Gamundi. He'll be speaking on kinetic sequence stratigraphy in, and its applications to exploration. <clears throat> Dr. Gamundi, Dr. lopez Gamundi, has close to 30 years in uh, experience uh, worldwide with experience in uh, prospect finding, play trend, definition, generation, and execution. His extensive experience in both onshore and offshore in uh, many areas of the world. He served as a, an assistive, assistant professor in sedimentology at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, where he also received his education in geology. Uh, he spent uh, much of his career in high-level positions with various operators, Texaco, Chevron, and Hess, and has instructed on a number of different industry courses, He's fluent in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And we want to remind you that uh, Dr. Lopez Gamendi does teach a class on sequence stratigraphy applied to oil and gas exploration. Uh, this is being offered in a public venue in Houston in both March and September. And so you can contact us if you're interested in that. Um, this is one of our uh, webinar series that we have coming up featuring many of our SCA instructors. Um, in January, um, we have uh, well stimulation with Leo Rodhart and Garrett Knitters, and then we also have uh, an actual fracture uh, type in controlling reservoir permeability with John Lorenz and Scott Cooper. So look for those upcoming events. And as you know, SCA, in addition to training, we also offer consulting, direct hire, and project and study services. And I would like to conduct a quick poll today uh, of our audience. It looks like we have quite a few of you already logged in. So I'm going to launch the first poll, and we're going to get some real-time feedback on what is your primary discipline. So we're starting to get your responses now. You'll find this in the uh, dashboard of um, the GoToMeeting uh, Series and it looks like the vast majority are geoscience. So almost all of you have voted. I'll go ahead and, and show those results. And so um, looks like 91% are geoscience. And let's go to our second question today. How much experience do you have in the oil and gas industry, full-time experience? And so again, we're getting real-time response from our audience. We have uh, quite a few of you who have, who have over 30 years experience, and then a good sampling among the other uh, demographics as well. So it looks like a very uh, broad spectrum of experience in this audience. Most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close this poll and share the results. Um, looks like we have a few people in each of the categories with 42% over 30 years. So I'll remind you today that as you, <clears throat> excuse me, as you participate in the webinar, uh, you will be muted, but you can uh, pose questions to Dr. Lopez Gamunde throughout the presentation by using the GoToWebinar question feature. Just go ahead and pose your questions there in the, the question box, and we'll cover those at the end, or we'll cover most of them at the end of the webinar, um, time permitting. And uh, after today's webinar, you'll have a chance to um, review the webinar. You'll receive a link to a recording of it. And we'll also give you an evaluation form and a link to registration details for the classes uh, that are offered in March and in September in Houston. So with that, I'm going to uh, pass the presenting rights over to uh, Oscar and let him start his presentation. Oscar, it's uh, your turn. Please take it away. Uh, thank you, Susan. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you, you guys are. Um, as uh, Susan said, the, the topic of this uh, short chat is kinetic sequence stratigraphy and growth strata, and they're interlinked, uh, obviously. Growth strata, as you can see in the picture of the field and in the seismic line from the Niger Delta uh, are essentially strata deposited during the formation. And that is, in a nutshell, 
you need to remember uh, uh, definition. That is the definition of growth strata. So now, if we take a look at uh, a few other uh, key definitions that we need to have in mind uh, are here in these four bullets that you can see. Growth or syntectonic strata. Syntectonic is another term that you will see uh, cited in, in, in many papers and contributions are stratigraphic interval intervals that were deposited during deformation. And kinetic sequences are, as any sequence in sequence of stratigraphy, are unconformity bound packages of, and this is the difference, thin and or folded strata adjacent to growing structures. And I have cited there in the second bullet a couple of uh, three or four uh, structures that we are familiar with in exploration, like mud and salt diapirs, and we will see how uh, uh, sedimentation adjacent and contemporaneous to the formation of that type of deformation uh, behave, and normal uh, and thrust faults associated. So growth strata are arranged in kinetic sequences in extensional and compressional settings. And this is very important. Usually we have this, uh, idea the growth strata, again, synthetonic strata, uh, contemporaneous with the formation, are mostly related to compressional uh, features. We will see also that uh, there we have some good examples in the basins where extensional uh, traps uh, prevail that we can, we can go further and discriminate a little bit uh, between uh, kinetic sequences. And as in sequence stratigraphy, uh, in kinetic sequence stratigraphy, we use the straddle terminations. We will review briefly the four basic straddle terminations, but just to give you the heads up, of those straddle terminations uh, that we use in sequence stratigraphy, the ones that are critical for identification of kinetic sequences are angular truncations and overlaps. And we will see some details of those. Just from a very basic point of view here, you have a nice roadside uh, kind of big uh, outcrop. You see the, the scale there, the, the cars. And we will discriminate here in this uh, large outcrop, pre-growth strata, growth strata, and post-growth strata. And how we define those? Very simply, by the pre-growth strata are those who, in general, they keep the same thickness. So those are where the four were deposited before the formation. Now you see like a wedge in the middle, which is growth. And clearly you, you see that there is a thinning over the uh, anticline structure below and expanding, uh, expanding that section toward the limbs. That's the trademark of uh, growth strata. And then you see another package above all the way to the horizon. And you, what you see there is uh, an interval, and the thickness of each of those beds is, uh, remains essentially unchanged through uh, the outcrop. That is post-growth. At that point, those sediments coming into the basin didn't see any bathymetric high, anything that needs to accommodate. And therefore, you have a big unconfined basin. <coughs> post-growth is... Uh, remains in terms of thickness, uh, remains the same. So what, if, if that is a little problematic to see, we will, we will do the same thing we do in, in seismic with this outcrop, and we will squeeze it. You know that in sequence stratigraphy, since we look at the straddle terminations and you see the four basic straddle terminations that, that we always use, we can add offlap as well, but just to keep it simple for now, those are the four, the downlap and top lap, angular truncation, where, which is essentially an angular and conformity coming from classic sequence stratigraphy, and on laps. Those are the four straddle terminations. And in here, if you squeeze, I squeeze uh, artificially here, this outcrop, that's what we do in seismic. We squeeze seismic lines in order to exaggerate the uh, straddle terminations, the angular relationships. And you will see better that between the pre-growth and the growth at the base, you will see a series of onlaps. And that will be one of the key elements to uh, 
discern where, when we are having and where we are having growth strategy. Growth strata are a relationship between, uh, since they are uh, syntectonic, uh, the two elements that rule or regulate uh, growth strata are the positional rate versus a structural uplift rate, or I would call it structural rate. So it's the relationship between these two rates that define the stratal termination and define the general geometry of the growth strata. Let's, let's take out the first one that you see, the parallel. And as I said before, if everything is parallel, clearly there is a, that's a pre-growth um, situation. And if you go to the lower right, the last one, the buttress on lap, as you can see, there is no major change. It's a passive feel of a depression already formed, and it's on the limb of an anticline. The rest of the terminations are uh, essentially describe all the possibilities of this balance between the positional rate and structural rate. It would take the, the one that is not uh, frame, which is the fanning uh, situation. As you can see, that, is, uh, that reflects uh, a clear balance between accommodation and uh, accommodation space, which is the balance between the uplift rate and the depositional rate. If you take the termination of those uh, strata, the growth strata, the thin toward the structure, as the margin of your basin, you will see that the margin of the basin is always in the same place. What it means is that for each step or drop in a, a subsidence that creates accommodation, there is an equivalent of lift. Therefore, that basin, which is confined, will remain in terms of size uh, uh, very uh, unchanged through time. Let's take a look now uh, in the middle of what is called progressive on lap. And that's the classic case of the positional rate that is uh, larger than a structural rate. And what you see is uh, what is called the progressive on lap, the first on lap that you see here, I will use the cursor, it's in this particular point, so that's the, that's the margin of your basin at that time, and the next one is here, and the next one is here, and it, pro and it broadens the margin of this basin. That is the case where the, the positional rate is more important than the structural. Um, and again, just to define uh, the terms, this is the pre-growth, and this is the growth strata. If the structural rate, of, in this case, uplift rate, it can be a mud diaper, a salt diaper, or a thrust, is uh, much more important than the positional rate, you will have an unconformity at the basic margin. And that it also, uh, it's, uh, it's good to go back, in this case, to the original definition of uh, sequence boundaries, you know, which can be erosional on the margin, uh, uh, as an erosional unconformity and its correlative conformity. So we're using the classic sequence of stratigraphic terms and definitions in order to define uh, this relationship between uh, growth, growth strata and pre-growth strata. The off-lap case is different when the structural rate is much more important than the positional rate. So this mini basin, if you want to use a term that is common in Gulf of Mexico, and this is a soil diaphragm, which is the merging structure, it's uh, becoming smaller and smaller. It's becoming more and more confined, as opposed to in progressive, in, in the case of progressive on-lapse, where it's expanded. So th that's the way you need to, uh, the mindset that you need to have in order to see growth strata. Now, growth strata can be in compressional and extensional settings. Those settings can be adjacent or it can be in completely different settings uh, geographically. In this particular case, which is a gravity driven um, fall and thrust belt, I just illustrate this portion just to show that in the extensional side close to the coastline uh, of any of these uh, fall thrust belts, you have an extensional uh, portion. And then it migrates into the so-called progressional zone, and we will see this in more detail, where all these structures 
are made up of free growth strata. And then when you see here clear uh, change in thickness, those are the ones that are related to the growth strata. So we will discuss a little bit the compressional and extensional uh, growth strata uh, in, in, different, in different modules. But what is important to know is that in this conjugate uh, of systems, you can have both in, uh, in, this, in the same line. Now let's take a look at how, how these things work a little bit, especially for mud and soil diapers. I will, I will just borrow some concepts from the Gulf of Mexico. As you know, Gulf of Mexico, uh, uh, most of the sediment of the largest uh, river and delta system of the US, the continent US, uh, dumps all the sediment over there. And if you have a, a mobile substrate, which is in this case the salt, uh, you will have a significant uh, salt diapirism. In other places like Niger Delta, Orinoco Delta, and others where the substrate is mobile as well, but it's mud, the uplift rate of uh, the mud diapirism and the salt di diapirism are, is drastically different. And that curve on the left explains uh, a little bit that. Uh, you start with the, de this is density, increasing density with depth. And as you can see, if we take the mix of sun and mud, which can be the over the, the delta system material, it reaches a point very fast where sun and mud uh, uh, crosses the density through depth uh, variation of salt. And that creates, uh, and if you take a this, Death, you will see that there is a significant uh, reversal of the density, and that explains why salt tries to be so fast to go up. The same happened with mud diaperism, and let's assume that mud is the substrate, the mobile substrate, but look at it with sand. But look at uh, the difference. The difference is rather small. That's why most of the mud diaperism is uh, allochthonous, and uh, 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 sorry, autochthonous, and most of the salt and in salt diapirism, you have uh, significant uh, allochthony uh, in canopies, and the uplift rate is much more important. Therefore, in any in any case where we see uh, salt diapirism, kinetic sequences are are easy to identify as opposed to in, in mud diapirism, which is a little more uh, difficult. The classic case of um, salt diapirism, other than the Gulf of Mexico, is the offshore Angola and the Kwanzaa place. And here you can see, in this particular case, you can see uh, a regional line, which is uh, 20 kilometers. Here you have the, the scale. You have obviously the most recent interest is in the pre salt, like in Brazil. Here you have the base of salt in, in light blue, you have the top of the salt in dark blue and everything that is above this uh, salt diapirs is essentially growth strata and we will see a detail here in the lower in the lower line and you start seeing those terminations that we were uh, we were discussing those are important because first of all you can define within this growth strata different packages and as long as you have an unconformity meaning all up on top and angular truncation below, you can define within the growth strata different kinetic sequences. If you want to drop the term kinetic, that's fine, and you can you can call those simply uh, sequences in the in the sequence stratigraphic uh, most traditional uh, approach. And as you know, an unconformity is defined, or a sequence boundary will be defined in many places by angular truncation below and all lap on top. And that will define your unconformity. In, uh, in, the, in the case that you see here, Pará Marañón is a little different, and this is gravity-driven. And most of the gravity-driven um, fall and thrust belts are related to mud diapirism. And you see first that you have a, a significant difference. Uh, there is some... Uh, recumbent faults. There is a vergence usually, and that is what is clear in the so-called toe thrust or compressional zone uh, of the gravity-driven fall and thrust belts. 
And in here, we'll see another details of all this growth strata here with the pre growth strata involved in this false most of the time thrusts. The lower part is Mexican ridges, uh, which is more symmetric, you know, and uh, that's just to give you an idea of the end members of this gravity driven uh, uh, fall belts. Now, in growth strata related to soil, we have seen already how they work in compressional uh, regimes. And actually, those mini basins uh, can be considered as uh, very confined basins that if uh, soil diapers is, is very active and the rate is very fast, you will, you will define that uh, in a very similar way as in the fall thrust belts uh, sold by mud diapers. Now, that doesn't mean, as, as we saw before, that you cannot have extensional uh, growth strata related to extensional settings locally uh, with soil. And that's the case with soil uh, withdrawal. This is a nice case of Angola with soil, soil withdrawal. You see the soil here. But more important than the soil here is what you can see here. In here, you clearly see a change in thickness. So these are candidates for gro growth strata. It reaches a point up here where everything, you know, we can discuss where exactly, but at least for sure at this level, you will see that there's no much difference in, in things. But here you see an expansion toward this side. That means that you have an expansion of the accommodation space here. And here, at the same time, you can do the same exercise by, by eyeballing the isopack of the thickness. And you will see that also there's a tendency to expand the section this way. And that in seismic is clearly seen as a, a divergent pattern of, uh, of, the, of the horizons. But if you see here, the expansion is more important. So you can define within this growth strata in a section of setting an early phase that is a little bit unusual, an early phase where the growth is not much. But here, the, the growth is much drastic. And the way to define that much drastic growth is through the thickness. Hmm? Thickness here and the change, the converging and the expanding of the seismic here is very clear. So you can start defining, in this case, two kinetic sequences within the growth strata. And, and we can apply this, uh, as we said. Well, here, there is an outcrop case. You know, it's always good to have an outcrop case. And this is, a, this is alpine geology where you can clearly see a sequence one. You see, from, from, uh, you see some kind of convergence here. And look at, look at here. This is called progressive onlap. You don't need to go to Austria. There are very many of those in the, color, in the Grand Canyon as well. But this is very clear, where you see an, uh, a truncation below and on lap above. That is the definition of a sequence boundary. In this particular case, is a kinetic sequence hmm, growth and, and the pre-growth below. And that's what, in the case of uh, Spain, is, uh, in this case, in the Afro, is very clear as well. You have all these on laps, progresses on lap on a surface. This is the pre-growth, and this is the growth strata. Let's go back to seismic, which is what we usually um, look on, on a daily basis. And when we see uh, here is a, is a complex gravity-driven fall and thrust belt. I, I call it complex because uh, it has the three elements, the extensional portion with the counter-regional normal fall, the translation, and then which is called the diapir zone, essentially, an inner thrust zone. And then the entire system was reactivated again and created another outer thrust zone, uh, which is this one here in brown. So when we look at a very regional line, that line that was highlighted in, in red there, what you can see in the seismic is the extension is here, and it's, this is where, where most of the gas in general uh, and the early phase of exploration in Niger Delta uh, started. And then you have the compression here, which is sometimes due to the to the deep of some of this thrust is this poorly imaged. Then you have a, of the inner thrust. Then you have a translation zone, 
or diapir zone. You can see clearly a diapir here. And then you have the outer thrust just before you have the basin plane. And here you have a, a scheme of, of this. This is an area with all this, the compression of the diaperic side in the inner thrust belt, all this thrust belt is a very important oil province. And also exploration has gone further into the so-called outer thrust. What is important here is because it has very good seismic and you can eat clearly see and illustrates very well the difference between uh, pre-growth and growth. And uh, dating here is very accurate, which is uh, very important as well. So what you see here is uh, this huge structure with the back thrust. Uh, this is basing work as I move my cursor to the left. And you see several, you know, for, there are several details. You can see the channel from the channel margin here, all those targets. But at this point, what I want to emphasize is that you have a structure here that I'm following with my cursor. More, uh, as you can see, the thickness of all these uh, intervals uh, is similar. This is a this is pre-growth involving this big structure. And above that, if you can see here, there's a wedge, there's a triangle that expands uh, toward this thrust and thins toward the limb and the crest of this structure here. This triangle defines your growth strata. And if you have an age for that, you can start dating when this structure was formed, where all your targets and just to give you an anecdotal information, these are the targets and these are the targets uh, in, in the Niger Delta. So what is important is you have identification of the kinetic sequence and this escape probably you can define only one kinetic sequence. And then just below the mud line, if you start seeing something that doesn't change much uh, laterally thickness. So somewhere here, very, very young, you have your post-growth strata. So you can you can almost liken this to the first uh, slide with the outcrop, and we can define the same three elements, the pre-growth, the growth, and the post-growth. Let's take a look at a, a similar line, uh, but I want just to uh, take a look at this portion here. A and again, with more detail, you can start seeing that you can define two kinetic sequences. Hmm? One, uh, the unconformity between those two kinetic sequences is, is the green is the truncation on this candidate for sequence boundary. And then you have the on lap on top, which is on red here. So somewhere here, you have uh, truncation below and on lap above. So those are your two kinetic sequences. Now, if you take the non-eroded portion, obviously, uh, because it's eroded by this unconformity, you take the non-eroded interval and try to see how that changes thickness, and you do the same thing with the upper kinetic sequence, let's say in this portion here, you will notice that the lower kinetic sequence has a, change, a lateral change in thickness that is much more important. So that means that the uplift of this adjacent structure was severe during this time and then a little more subdued at this time and it reaches a point in this particular case that this structure even though slowly but keeps uh, growing all the way in order to uh, you can see it in the mud line so these are very recent structures and that is key this very recent structures, they will look very nice, they will map very nice, there will be probably four-way closures elongated at right angles of the of the slide here. Uh, but it will have a problem because migration, unless it's extremely recent, uh, will uh, will not work. So uh, one of the first applications for for uh, kinetic uh, uh, kinetic sequence of stratigraphy analysis, stratigraphic analysis is that you can time these structures and combine that with the time of uh, charge and migration 
gives you an idea if this uh, <coughs> excuse me this structure were were actually charged or not so that that is uh, in a nutshell what is expanded obviously in the course but this is is essentially applications of uh, kinetic sequence stratigraphy in uh, a compression of settings just a few words uh, growth strata and kinetic sequences in extension of settings and here I just put a, a line, you know, not much editing because I want you to take a look and uh, be your own interpreter of uh, a very nice half graven. There is some a little bit of four plane reflection here that helps to to define the master fall. Uh, I don't see much on lap other than on the flexural side. There is a little fall here, but you see the expansion close to the master fall. Tectonic driven subsidence in half gravens is, is the key driver for uh, creation of accommodation space. And in this case, it's very clear that everything is converging over the flexural or, uh, margin of the, or the ramp of the half, uh, half gravity, and it's expanded clearly here. All these strata are growth strata by definition. And somewhere above the salt, by the way, there is a salt base of salt is uh, running around here, top of salt is around here, it's all a lot uh, autochthonous salt. And there is a salt window here. Um, many, many of this strata here, needless to say, are, are post growth. The model that uh, applies uh, the modern analog, uh, obviously, is, is the in East Africa resistant, where you have exactly the same thing a fall margin and a flexural margin. And the depot center right now is filled with a huge lake. Hmm? Uh, and, and that is at uh, this level. A very good analog for this half gravens uh, and to take a look at the growth of strata in a section of settings. So why why these uh, uh, basins are important? Because many times you have a source rock at the base uh, of somewhere in the in the half graven field, hmm? and this is this is a classic uh, definition of overfill balance or underfill uh, lake basin types. And in at least two of the three, you have a good good potential in terms of uh, sediment rate and trying not to dilute uh, organic matter of the presence of uh, source work. So we will park this because it's, it's well known, and just just want to uh, just highlight that one of the how we can apply uh, kinetic sequence stratigraphy to kind of predict where in this in kind of a frontier area where you don't have a lot of uh, well penetrations and you are your respiration is driven by by seismic if we can discriminate candidates for uh source rock deposition in a half graph that's one of the applications well the first the first thing you need to see if uh if there is a, a difference in uh, in that basin field so so here is very clear somewhere here just thicknesses are not changing. I would say that somewhere here you have growth, uh, uh, post-growth. Uh, in this triangle that I'm showing with my cursor, is probably, it is growth strata in an extensional setting. Somewhere here you have your master fault, and this is your field. Now let's take a look at this field. Why I say this is growth strata? Because there is a drastic change, and remember, Try to eyeball this change in thickness, hmm? uh, avoiding, uh, in this case, in the lower part of the truncation. But try to see, and you will see that there's systematic change in thickness. So if we take a look at more detail, we will see that by these orange arrows that you see here, I'm pointing, uh, you see the truncation. And above that, you will see on lap. Those relationships will kind of die toward the depot center. And it's clear because what is happening here where I have my cursor is the correlative conformity of this unconformity. Again, using classic stratigraphic, sequence stratigraphic terms and, and definitions. Here you have your master fall. And what you can see now, I, I tempted to put the top of the rift here of this half graven. There is a change in thickness this way. But look, look at this. This, and it's very common, the lower kinetic sequence is the one that has more, most drastic changes in thickness. 
what it means is this masterful has been driving the subsidence in in uh, next to the fault remember that in all these asymmetric half gravens the accommodation space is dictated by tectonic substance subsidence related to the throw of this master fault so accommodation space and therefore the possibility for this kinetic sequence to be deposited in an underfield condition is uh, probably the most likely case as opposed to this upper kinetic sequence which by the very moderate change in thickness you can say without any problem that accommodation space has not changed a lot uh, across this line so chances of in this bipartite growth strata uh, uh, subdivision with the lower kinetic sequence and the upper kinetic sequence chances of having a uh, underfill stage therefore conditions for uh, sulfur deposition are much better in the lower kinetic sequence than in the upper kinetic sequence and hmm, Why, why this is important? Because uh, there is a renewed renew interest in half gravens and, and, and the sacks over, over them. Uh, obviously, in, in North Sea is a classic place for half graven traps, and all this is very important. But also now in the prison of the, of the offshore basins in Brazil with huge reserves, this has become uh, an important issue and it's and there are several cases of half gravens where you have the source of there and even in the sack above that mimics a little bit the the thickness uh, distribution of the half of the underlying half gravens so what is happening here and uh, let's resume uh, uh let's go back to the case of, of brazil this is from uh santos this is a summary of how growth strata in extensional settings can be important to, uh, to be discriminated uh, for several reasons. We have discussed already how important is this early phase or early kinetic sequence, which is mostly, most of the times characterized by high subsidence, therefore uh, uh, can be considered an underfill stage of any basin. In, in, in this particular case, in this half gravin basin. This is the area most likely where you will have uh, your source rock development. Then when you move toward the flexural side and the ramp side on both kinetic sequences, the lower, the upper, and even this, which is the sac below, below the salt, which is also a kinetic sequence, because you see a change in thickness that reflects still the morphology of the underlying half gravity as i said for all these kinetic sequences that they are losing accommodation space toward the flexural uh, uh flexural margin or ramp of the half gravity for all these sequences the chances of having uh reservoirs is important in this area so this is a classic petroleum system with a uh, bed parallel migration from the source most likely in the lower kinetic sequence going all this way to the flexural margin whether you will have plastics or in the case of santos you will and um and other in, in the santos basin offshore brazil you will have carbonates when sediment supply is not very poor so definition of kinetic sequences even in the in extensional settings is very important and is coming kind of late in the game as opposed to for uh compressional settings where clearly the dating of those uh compressional structures is important because it defines the timing between charge and a structure and which is key for many of these very nice but very recent structures that I have illustrated uh, in this uh, talk. With that, I will probably leave you guys with this uh, kinetic sequence stratigraphic 
bullets, which I think summarize what we just said. In compressional settings, the identification of growth strata will allow us to refine the timing of relation between the trap formation and charge migration. You know How you do that? By dating the kinetic sequences, those triangles, those growth strata that you could see in the Niger Delta and in other examples that we uh, discussed in, in, in outcrop. In extensional structures, and I give you a couple of examples, asymmetric half gravity, but it can also be solved with roll basis. Like in the case for the PINDA section uh, expansion in the Angola seismic line, the distinction between an early kinetic sequence, which is commonly characterized by significant accommodation space, more than sediment supply, and a late kinetic sequence is very important because it's critical to propose source rock deposition, potentially source rock deposition, in, in the lower kinetic sequence. Identification of growth strata with converging seismic patterns that we saw on the ramps is critical for identification, identification of reservoirs. And the case we just saw from Santos is, is, is very, um, very uh, interesting in the sense that reservoirs are most, I would say 100% related in, in those discoveries to the flexural side of the half gravids, either in the rift section, but most commonly in the immediately overlying sac section. So with that, I will conclude this and I will be uh, opening the floor to any questions uh, you have. Thank you. Great, thanks, Oscar. So I want to remind our listeners today that you can pose your questions using the question box in your dashboard there. Um, uh, certainly, uh, there's an opportunity for you to uh, receive a link to today's recording. You'll get an evaluation form. You'll get a link to registration for the classes that Oscar teaches on sequence stratigraphy applied to oil and gas exploration. Those will be offered in Houston in March <coughs> and September. And um, if you attend Oscar's classes, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to pose your questions in English or Spanish or Portuguese. But uh, today, if, if you're posing your questions, please put them in English please. into the uh, question form, uh, or else you'll get them read by me with a French accent. So, um, Oscar, tell us a little bit about how we can use kinetic stratigraphy to address the charge and structuring relationships. Well, as I said, in, in, in compressional, uh, in very young compressional settings, and a gravity-driven fault thrust belt is, is a classic case. You have, uh, we all get, get in love with the wonderful uh, structures that are formed there. Those are elongate four-way closures. Uh, sometimes they rely on thrusts, but uh, the four-way closure of a portion of those structures are significant. So from the trap geometry point of view, uh, reservoir and seal, since the, we are in deep water environments, we are, we are in good shape. Most of the times the risk for those traps come in the timing. And by timing and having uh, accurate dating or semi-accurate dating on the growth strata, you can say, for example, that the structure was formed uh, uh, between 10 million years and 5 million years, because you can actually date the adjacent growth strata. If you know that your migration was between, let's say, 20 and 15 million years, you really have a problem. And, we'd, uh, and that is very common, not only in the Niger Delta or any other similar setting, you know, uh, Orinoco Delta comes to my mind, where um, deep water bid runs are offered systematically, or the Amazon, there are several cases around the world, and in some in Mexico as well, uh, in, the, in the coming bid runs. So from that point of view, it is critical, because the structure was not there at the time of migration, as simple as that. So I know you mentioned that the Grabenfill is more likely to be um, source rock rather than reservoir rock, especially if it's early in time. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the Grabenfill and the source rock? Oh, okay, that's a good. Um, 
yeah, as I, as I mentioned, uh, it seems to be the the South Atlantic and and even the North Sea in some places. Even though there are some faults on the ramp side, you can you can define it structurally as uh, all these rifts as half gravels, meaning that it, it have a master fault that can be composite or not on on the on the fault side, and then. Climbing up, you have a ramp or a flexural ramp. Sometimes you have some some minor faulting, but it's, it's, it's a very asymmetric uh, configuration. Those have grabbing and start with little throw, and the fault keeps growing and growing. And the fault, the movement along the the fault plane, is the driver for creation of accommodation. So close to the fault margin you will always have the largest uh, accommodation. This falls usually start with significant throw, therefore significant creation of accommodation space, and then they kind of die at the very end. That's why you have those two very classic kinetic sequences. The one that is uh, has a drastic change in the thickness in the lower part. And, and therefore, if you have a change there, that means that you have a lot of accommodation space close to the master fault. And if that is very fast and sediment rate cannot keep up with that, you will create what is called an underfill stage of a basin. Hmm? Sub sediments cannot fill all the uh, accommodation space created. Those are conditions in marine settings or like in the East Africa Rift System, uh, Lacustrian System, for um, organic uh, matter deposition. So if, if you are in an area where you need to discriminate different half gravens, go for those that sh clearly show uh, a lower kinetic sequence with uh, drastic uh, changes in thicknesses, uh, in thickness, overall thickness, because those are the ones that will, uh, will represent uh, underfill conditions and potentially source rocks. Now, that is for the source rock, but I want to mention or, or repeat myself a little bit. There is potential on the other end of these half gravens in the growth strata for reservoirs because you decrease accommodation space and therefore that combination with bed parallel migration, you know, similar to what you have in Fordham Basin by the smaller scale, this bed parallel migration will, will uh, feed all this uh, reservoirs on the ramp side, on the opposite side of the half gravity. So it is a perfect system. If you have a seal, a salt, uh, uh, like you have in Brazil, well, you have all the elements of a internal system. You don't need anything else. So the next question from our audience is, would you recommend using plain strain 2D structural restoration and serial cross sections to nail down the timing for some of the examples shown today. Uh, yes, I will, and uh, that's part of the of the of the course. Actually, we do a couple of exercises uh, doing that. Actually, we did do we did two. Yes. Great. Next question from one of our listeners. I can imagine in some instances that in the case where structural growth exceeds sedimentary growth, there could be a clastic influx into the basin center, impacting the dirtiness in the source rocks in the thickest areas, especially the Hofgrabens. Is there any seismic character that you have seen that indicates this possibility or risk? Uh, yes. Um, in uh, close uh, and this very interesting uh, topic, the, uh, close to the master fault in uh, in the analogs that you know the East Africa uh, rift system is probably the best analog. Uh, but over there, what you can see is the formation of uh, uh, what is called fan deltas. These are deltas that are coming up from uh, elevated, and when you go to Tanzania, there are mountains which are elevated by the master fault. And over there, you have those that are they are short distance, and they they form like an apron. When you go on a size, and over there you have this fan delta, can be candidates. But once you move away from that, and they're uh, they have been sampled, you you move away a, a little bit from the master fault. Immediately, that is kind of a small area where sediment rate dominates. When you go to the adjacent depot center, there is organic matter uh, being uh, 
um, deposited and more importantly preserved uh, in the East African risk uh, system lakes. So is that true? Now seismically is very interesting because in very good seismic you can see for the fan deltas it will be almost a chaotic, uh, very very distinctive and very narrow uh, belt of seismic phases along along the master fault. You know, at right angles of all the lines that I show you, and it move when you move away into the basin, you start seeing that that size the seismic phases start to be organized. Uh, they are obviously divergent, but they are high to moderate amplitude, but they are very very laterally continuous. Hmm? So that. That is the indication that you're moving from something with sediment input to something that it's uh, equivalent, if you want, for those who work more in marine environments to what you see in the basin plane seismic phases. Okay. So the next question: In the absence of any counter-regional dip, can a cliniform provide strategic st stratigraphic trap entrapped by maximum flooding services? Yes, of course, and uh, we, we have not talked during the course. We talk a lot about shoreline trajectories and and um, uh, the basic elements, which is uh, piling up clinoform, whether aggradational, progradational, retrogradational. Yes, the the trick there is that any clinoform, as you as you know, uh, has a down deep um, transition phases transition to to um, hemipelagic or you look or if you want pro delta or even beyond shales and in the back you have you need to rely if you don't have um, a structural component you need to rely if you're looking at only stratigraphic uh, trap you need to rely on um, on lagoon faces which are muddy is true but it may be a, a scape for for uh, what is preserved in the center part of the of the clinoform, where you, which is the the kingdom, let's say, of the realm of the para sequences. Just summarizing a little bit uh, uh, this uh, a little bit off-topic question, but it's very interesting. Now, if you ask me, I would love to have some tilt, mm -hmm. so, and that applies also to incised valley fields. You know, they are perfect stratigraphic traps, but if you ask me, I would like to have some tilt um, and uh, that will help the flooding surface draping everything above. So in some of the cross sections you showed, um, you indicated the expanded section is certainly uh, often an indicator of, of this type of growth. Is, is there any time the expanded section would not be associated with the kinetic sequence stratigraphy, the growth? The only case that I can think of is with, with this passive, if you remember, there was one of those uh, relationships and um, uh, cartoons about uplift rate and the positional rate. And there is one that is called passive or buttress. Uh, the thickness, there is, you can be full if you don't see a, a regional line or semi-regional line, and you will see that obviously things stop at the, imagine a bathymetric height that has always been there and passive feeling. That passive feeling obviously will thin close to the structure. But when you move just away from there, the whole thing is the thickness of the section and each of those intervals you identify is always the same. So if you take that exceptional case, I would say that is a rule of thumb. Each time you have expansion or convergence on the other end, depending on uh, where you are in, uh, in, in the section and how far your line can go, uh, start suspecting that you are in the growth strata uh, domain. So you've indicated that the growth strata, high probability for uh, accumulating source rock and, and relatively low uh, probability for accumulating reservoir rock. Uh, with, with unconventional reservoirs, is, is there a chance that we're overlooking some of the opportunities? Uh, yes, and, and let, me, let me clarify that. that. That applies to 
uh, growth strata in extensional settings, and just the half raven that we discussed. Okay, uh, there are several cases where um, traditional exploration and production is coming from uh, conventional reservoirs. You know, many of these half gravens have uh, uh, reservoirs on these fan deltas, although limited, close to the fall margin. And there is also um, traditional or conventional reservoirs on the flexural side, uh, as I said. But there is a source rock in between. And those source rocks are being studied right now in many places because it's anytime you have a source rock and you have the, the ideal geomechan or mechanical conditions in terms of composition, uh, you have it. So every single source rock that we discuss for this half gravens is a candidate for unconventional. Very good. So that wraps up the questions we've received from our audience today, and we're at the end of our time commitment. So again, we want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, later today, you'll receive a link to a recording of the webinar that you can share with your colleagues, uh, an evaluation form. We welcome your feedback and you'll get a link to registration details for the public classes that Oscar will be teaching on sequence stratigraphy applied to oil and gas exploration. Those are scheduled for March 5 through 9 in Houston and September 4 through 7 also in Houston. And of course, we can set up in-house classes at your convenience. Thanks for everyone to, for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate your participation. Have a good week.